tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I have to buy a tent when I put in the street, when I put sign, that what do City Kelowna to people. Time is running out for a Kelowna senior who will soon be without a roof over his head after the city deems his home unsafe. Plus... Spin to the front, one to the score, JT Canucks fan frenzy. Well, for every single game the Canucks were in, it was an extra million dollars because people would fill the, you know, the bars, they would stay downtown after work. Everything will help us. Through COVID, we, we lost millions. What the team's success means for Metro Vancouver businesses still trying to recoup from the pandemic. And... Playbacks have been very effective about moving the animal within the lagoon, just not out of the lagoon. More on the ongoing rescue efforts to move a stranded orca calf to safety. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Janola Hamilton. Thanks for joining us. A Kelowna senior is facing the imminent demolition of the home he has lived in for more than a decade. The city says this comes after years of trying to work with the owner over his multiple building code violations, which have made the property unsafe and unsightly. Brady Strachan has our top story. I buy it just before winter, one inch plywood. Yanu Skurlecki shows off some of the building materials he's collected on his property. For the past 15 years, he's been renovating his home on the edge of Kelowna, but without the needed building permits, according to the city. This beam is supposed to be stayed here. The view of the vineyards from his yard is breathtaking, but the property is an eyesore. Building materials and equipment are scattered throughout. The deck is under construction and a large retaining wall is incomplete. Three years ago, the city declared the property unsafe and a nuisance and ordered Gerlecki to demolish the home and remove the construction materials, something the 73-year-old has been fighting ever since. By law, somebody come in, okay, how is it no safe? What no safe? Show me. The city is now taking action, and on Monday it notified Gerlecki a demolition crew is coming next week. It's a shock to Gerlecki as he hired an engineer to examine the home and retaining wall and sent that report to the city. The engineer found no significant defects inside the building that would give rise to any serious safety concerns. Demolition of the home and the retaining wall, the report says, is not warranted based on the alleged safety hazard concerns alone. Gorlecki has filed for a court injunction to try and stop the demolition, but a court date to hear the matter has been postponed. And meanwhile, the city of Kelowna says Gorlecki has been given significant time to deal with the issues on the property and another extension will not be granted. Now, Gerlecki and his friends are trying to remove equipment, materials, and half a lifetime of possessions off the property. He's going to be ending up in the streets. He's going to be homeless, like many others. And um, I think it's unfair what the city is doing without them doing a thorough investigation of of the house itself. It's a daunting task considering the 5,000 pounds of meat stored in seven freezers from a previous property where he raised pigs. When everything is full, full meat. Every fridge is packed. When I give friends, on the rest, I have to make sausage. Gerlecki says he won't go down without a fight, both in court and in public protest. Then I have to buy a tent when I put in the street, when I put sign, that what do city Kelowna to people. When I make this very loud at across country. Time is running out, however. The city says the demolition will begin next Tuesday. Brady Strack and CBC News, Kelowna. The Integrated Homicide Investigation Team has taken over a missing persons case in Surrey. Police say they have evidence that 
a 28-year-old woman may be the victim of foul play. They say Navdeep Kaur was last seen the night of February 22nd in Surrey near the corner of 123rd Street and 78th Avenue. Kaur is South Asian, 5 foot 5 and weighs about 125 pounds. She has long black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about her disappearance is being asked to contact police. It may seem early, but BC's wildfire season is already underway. Across the province, nearly 100 fires are burning. Following last year's record-setting season, Joel Ballard takes a look at what this summer could have in store and how the lingering drought could make things worse. 2023 was the most destructive wildfire season in BC's history. And some experts worry this year is following in its footsteps. We've kind of got the repeat of the pattern that we saw last spring that made us so vulnerable to fire last year. Daniel says we've had below average rainfall and a low snowpack. Right now, there are already 95 fires burning across BC. Some of them holdover fires from last year, also known as zombie fires, burning deep under the soil. So when you get snow melt, and now the surface of the soil begins to dry out, the fire will creep back up to the surface. And all you need is a warm, sunny day with a bit of a breeze, and we have a surface fire beginning to spread again. This year, there's been little snowfall on the mountains. We're seeing snowpacks right now. They're about 34% below where they should be this time of year. Shea says a healthy snowpack is crucial to lowering the risk of a devastating wildfire season. What little there is, he says, is already starting to melt. You'll see an early melt out of the snowpack, which has a whole sort of chain reaction of effects. It will lower uh, soil moisture levels. Uh, we'll see lower fuel moisture contents in the forests, and that's what you know sets things up for a, a, another bad fire season. Parts of BC have now seen persistent drought conditions for several seasons, and some experts say it has caused deep drying in the soil leading to potential tree mortality. If we've got this extended drought coupled with too many trees on the landscape and they're all competing for less and less resources, especially water, we start to stress trees. We get some that fall prey to insects and diseases. Others die just because of lack of water. And that creates more fuel. He says it's hard to predict exactly what this wildfire season has in store. Right now, he's crossing his fingers for rain. If we don't get much rain this June, then we'll be, it'll be a very difficult season. At that point, it's just ignition. Ahead of the summer, those in the wildfire community say now is the time for homeowners to focus on making their homes fire smart by clearing fallen debris and wildfire fuels. It's not if, but when fire is coming to many communities. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Coquitlam. Two trucking companies that were involved in back-to-back -back overpass strikes earlier this week have had their licenses suspended. The disciplinary action comes as the province continues to crack down on infrastructure crashes. As Sorab Sandu reports, it's a move being applauded by some in the industry who say better training is also needed. On Monday, a cube truck hit a pedestrian overpass in Stanley Park. Less than 24 hours later, another overpass strike. This time, a commercial truck hitting an overpass near the entrance of the Messy Tunnel in Richmond. Both companies involved have now had their licenses suspended. It's a part of the province crackdown on infrastructure crashes. The results can also be catastrophic. We have just witnessed a catastrophic event in Baltimore where a bridge collapsed due to a, a hit uh, by, by a vessel. This safety advocate says the proposed changes to BC's Commercial Transport Act are necessary. Under the proposed legislation, truck drivers involved in overpass strikes will be met with steeper penalties, which could include paying fines up to $100,000 and as much as 18 months in jail. However, Shalabi says it might not be enough to curb the problem completely. Regulations and fines and, and licenses are, are, or permits are one way to address this, but the, that goes hand in hand with improved training, improved awareness and education. The, the problem stems from the overall lack of awareness when it comes to over 
oversized and overdimensional freight movement. As a long-time truck driver, Dan Dickey says the province also needs to invest more in resources so enforcement can be more widespread. Until you have the, the staff and the personnel that are educated and prepared to do the enforcement, you know, it's, it's not going to change anything. Dickey believes the part of the problem is undertrain new drivers in the industry who lack experience and familiarity with BC's roads. There's a lot of new drivers coming into the country from other areas all over the world and they're unfortunately being pressured into situations that they may not be fully experienced or fully capable or equipped to handle. They are also under pressure to carry uh, uh, heavier loads, larger vehicles, and sometimes without having sufficient uh, training and understanding. Under the current regulations, new commercial drivers in BC are required to take mandatory entry-level training. The program includes 140 hours of practical experience behind the wheel. But these experts say the latest overpass strikes prove better training and education is needed. Saurabh so Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. The Vancouver Canucks haven't clinched their playoff spot just yet, but as Zara Premji explains, the impact of their wins and being one of the best in the NHL right now is already bringing a much-needed boost to the economy. Goal after goal Spins it in front. One time to score. has led to dollar after dollar. When the Canucks scored, we were able to measure. We had a, a number of uh, restaurants online that, you know, the consumption of beer went up. And if the Canucks didn't score and the other police, that, you know, that people would stop ordering drinks. So it's very much tied to the success. And no pressure on the Canucks, but their success has helped inject life back into a hurting post-COVID economy, according to the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association. People want to be around other like-minded people. When their team scores a big playoff goal, they want to celebrate with others. They want to be part of an atmosphere. If they can't be in the rink itself, perhaps that's in a restaurant or a pub. And Tostenson adds the success of the Canucks could just be the silver bullet the restaurant industry is searching for. Similar to what happened in 2015 when the Canucks last had a home playoff game. At that time, we did a calculation and, and we had a number of a million dollars per game that it meant to food and beverage in Greater Vancouver. So for every single game the Canucks were in, it was an extra million dollars. A direct correlation restaurants and hotels are banking on. You remember when Obama said hope is on its way? And, uh, and I think that's really what this is all about right now. So it's one step towards the recovery. And, you know, we'll see increase in occupancy over the game. Our bars will be busy. So it's great for the city. And experts say fans may be a little more willing to spend those dollars because they've been waiting so long for this moment. This is a playoff-starved market, and I think the fans will turn out, especially because they don't know how long this is going to last. There's no promises once you get to the postseason. But the hope is there. They need one more to win to get in the playoffs, so very excited to see that happen. Go Canucks, except for the, against the Oilers. <laughs> go Canucks, go! Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. To the Western Hockey League now, after years of struggle, the Prince George Cougars have set franchise records. The team has won its first WHL Western Conference title and are entering the postseason as the top-rated team in the Canadian Hockey League. The Cougars will be playing Game 2 of the playoffs tomorrow night. Darius Madavi joins us now with our look at our Easter weekend weather. Darius? Well, we've had that uh, no more lightning last night. The uh, thunderstorms did wrap up uh, earlier this week, but still lots of rain and precipitation coming over the last 24 hours. But now you can see starting to calm down here uh, on the uh, in the south coast and on Vancouver Island. If we zoom out to the rest of the province, though, still a little bit of activity happening in the uh, southeast over the last 12 hours. That may continue into tomorrow, but for the most part, we're starting to wrap up across the province, and we've seen that cloud start to clear out as well. So really just some more scattered showers and flurries overnight tonight, and then pretty much drying up across the board by tomorrow. If we zoom out to the rest of the province for our conditions tonight, you can see that little bit of activity continuing in the southeast, maybe even a small chance of a thunderstorm early this evening for parts of the Okanagan. But generally speaking, we are just going to be clearing up into tomorrow. And if we come to our uh, overnight forecast here in Vancouver, 
nothing but clear skies and calm conditions. It's going to be a warm, sunny weekend. Thanks so much, Darius. After the break, more on the ongoing rescue efforts to move a stranded orca calf to safety after its mother died earlier this week. That's next. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream. Macaroni and cheese is a staple for many Canadians. Now a group of kids in Saskatchewan are using thousands of boxes of craft dinner in an attempt to break a Guinness world record all for a good cause. <laughs> a uh, very well intended attempt to set a world record for the largest single serve food box domino topper. We got 13,000 boxes and we're gonna donate it to the food bank after we do the topple dominoes with it. Putting box after box and then we go back and knock it like this because every box has to be exactly one box apart. As fast as possible but try not to knock it over. My topple team as I refer to them as, uh, they're 11 and 12 year old students, elementary school students but they're so eager, the 12 of them, to come and, and make this uh, a reality. I had to do a little bit of domino practice at recesses. I've knocked over it twice. I knocked Sadly. over it once. We leave a gap of three boxes. So if something happens and it gets knocked over, the whole thing will not be knocked over. <laughs> the community really turned out and supported us and provided us with about 7,000 boxes. But uh, then we, we kind of hooked up with the Kraft Heinz Canada people, and they were so excited about what we were doing. They gave us an additional 5,500 boxes on top of what we had raised as a community. Mr. Fox likes to take three students every week, right? Yeah. To the food bank, and we get to help him. And so this is just amazing, too. And it's just great helping out. All of the food gets donated to the local food bank. It's all going to a worthy cause. It's all going to combat food insecurity here in Saskatchewan. He's going to pick names out of a hat and then whoever he picks is the person that gets to knock it down. It's going to look amazing and it's going to be so much fun to watch and I'm so just so excited. It's been one week since a pregnant big Biggs Orca died after she ended up stranded by low tide on the jagged shore on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island. A two-year-old calf left behind. Two First Nations communities have been working with marine mammal scientists ever since to try to coax the calf back into the open ocean in the hope of re reuniting it with a pod of endangered whales. Yvette Bren brings us this story. An orca calf, not quite two years old, circles the waters of an inlet off the coast of Vancouver Island, trapped and alone. This calf has weeks uh, to live if it's not uh, getting any nutrients, so we know that our time is, our timeline is short. Last weekend, the calf followed her pregnant mother into a remote inlet here. The mother was hunting seal, but became trapped in a narrow, shallow lagoon. 
it's a huge shame, but it, it is the risk and the gamble that these animals play with that kind of very near shore technique of sort of corralling an animal into the shallows. Community and First Nations members tried to save the mother, but she died. Oh, poor girl. That's so sad. Attention quickly turned to the calf, which they've named Brave Little Hunter, or Quisaheus. Ten vessels worked to save the calf Thursday. Scientists used whale recordings in a device that bangs metal pipes to urge it out to sea. Playbacks have been very effective about moving the animal within the lagoon, just not out of the lagoon. So far, the still nursing calf seems healthy, but it needs food. A last ditch effort may involve using a sling to hoist the calf past the shallows, back to the open waters where the tight knit teapod can hear her call. I'm optimistic just based on the fact that it often literally takes a village to raise some of these calves and the whale will have strong bonds with other family members if it can find them. Locals say they've seen the calf eating birds, so brave little hunter hopefully still has a chance. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, if you're thinking of buying a bunny this Easter, make sure you want to keep it. In Vancouver, abandoned bunnies are taking root in the suburbs, beaches, and even at the airport. As Georgie Smythe tells us, the problem has existed for years, but it's getting worse. In this case, it seems the difference between a pet and a pest is time. At some point, rabbits were left here, and bunny math means with time, one plus one can equal hundreds. The odd rabbit here and there takes a while, but when you're abandoning a lot in one place, you can have an explosive colony pretty quickly. These are all rabbit homes here. For years, the city has discouraged people from feeding and abandoning rabbits in Vancouver's parks, but its animal shelters are overrun and no longer accepting surrenders. Advocates say some feel it's more humane to let them go in places like this than have them euthanized. Now they're expecting a springtime bunny boom. It's sad, um, like they are domestic rabbits, so ultimately they don't belong outdoors. Oh my God, it's lunchtime. Some are rescued and end up in outreach places like this bunny cafe, where people pay to feed, cuddle and maybe adopt. I think my bunny would like a friend, but I have it in my room, so I don't really want two bunnies in my room. But they can't be rehomed fast enough, and the supply of bunnies in the great outdoors just keeps coming. We can all see that the existing patchwork of municipal approaches is not working to curb this problem. Often provinces regulate the breeding of dogs, for instance, for very good reason. But we also need to start to regulate the breeding of rabbits as well as the sale of rabbits. Sterilization is also one way to fix this rabbit growth, but it needs buy-in fast. Without intervention, the problem will just keep multiplying. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. A popular mini train is full steam ahead for its 31st season. When we come back, we head to the Burnaby Central Railway for a trip around the track. Guys, it looks so cool right now. I'm Ethan Ng. I guess I started out making videos that were bad. It's really bad stuff that I would never want anyone to see. I think when we were making therapy dogs, it, it was not like a progression of that. So when we did therapy dogs, that really felt like the first one. So it wasn't really me spearheading my intentions as a filmmaker to the project, but more so lending my skills as a filmmaker to make the project happen. And same with Justin and his skills. Me and Justin are really good at doing stunts. We're really good with physicality. And it's like, how do we integrate that with telling a story about being young? We wanted to make a cool movie, and at least for Therapy Dogs, that movie wasn't necessarily about being safe. It was about being truthful and that was truthful to us. We were in our secret uh, training ground, uh, Ninja Star Academy. We were just doing some training and getting inspired, and now you're in the, our other HQ, which is the Shy Kids HQ here in Toronto. 
And this is where the editing happens after the action. We come here and we cut it up. This is the part where there's like that hyper montage of high school in 2007. The internet is your sandbox. This pretty much served as the basis for what therapy dogs would be. Our movie is really no different than all of these other yearbook videos or high school memories. We just wanted to do a really try hard version of that. We used a lot of different cameras in therapy dogs and the really great thing that I think young filmmakers should realize is that when you have like a bad camera, that comes with audience perceptions. They think that you're an amateur, and once you do something really surprising in front of that camera, it'll rug pull them, and it'll be really cool. As a director, you do not want to be responsible for your friend getting hurt. Here's the thing, okay? When you don't have any money, you need to make spectacle, right? It's all about showmanship. I think nature like, gives you a lot. When you're in the forest, like, why not like pick the berries that are around you than like getting stuff that's way, you know, exotic and out of reach. <laughs> this is the spirit of <laughs> yeah. DIY. I'm sure any professional fighter would look at this and like want to vomit, but I mean, this is, we gotta make the best of what you have. I did all of this myself. You can do everything yourself. The reason things aren't being made is because they're waiting for someone or something to happen. You don't need to wait for money or people. You have something as a young filmmaker that no one else has. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On April 13th, join CBC at the Vancouver Vasaki Festival. Drop by the CBC Vancouver tent, say hi, and win some fun CBC prizes. The Vasaki Festival continues in Surrey on April 20th. The event features some of the biggest celebrations outside India with colorful floats, community performers, and live music all rich in culture. More info at cbc.ca slash bc. Darius Madavi is back with a look at our weather. Darius, are we going to see sun for the Easter goers, I guess I could call them? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> lots of sunshine this weekend, pretty much no matter where you are in the province. A little bit of cloud building in for uh, some parts of the interior, uh, maybe by the end of tomorrow and into Sunday. But for now, we're clearing up. Uh, Monday, some of that cloud reaches us here on the coast as well. But for the most part, it's going to be fairly sunny no matter where you are. Maybe it's just with some cloudy periods. And then a little bit of rain coming in for the northwest. But after tonight, nothing for the southern uh, parts of the province. So in terms of temperatures, those are also coming up. We're going to have a very warm and sunny weekend. Those freezing levels by Sunday expected to rocket up beyond 3,000 meters for the southern parts of the province. So we're talking uh, definitely spring skiing conditions. We're talking, uh, you know, definitely no snow, except those, uh, even on those highest peaks. So if we were gonna get any precipitation, it would be falling as rain. That said though, tomorrow is a pretty calm day across BC. The Northwest is maybe getting a bit of a showers or flurries, but across the South, no precipitation to speak of. Just that sun as that cloud slowly starts to clear out. And here in BC, or here in Vancouver, sorry, we're just looking at a mainly sunny day. Tomorrow, a little bit of that cloud probably clearing out in the morning, uh, or sorry, returning in the afternoon. And then a sunny day Sunday, and then really calm conditions into midweek. All right, Doris, before you go. It is Fun Fact Friday. Some families are decorating eggs for Easter, but Darius, there are some eggs that naturally have colorful shells. Tell me uh, a little bit about that. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. So I think we're all familiar with the Easter eggs that we hunt for and we take a look for uh, ourselves during the uh, Easter holidays. Oh, this is going much faster than I thought. Let's move on to some of the birds that actually lay those eggs naturally. The first one, one that we're probably familiar with here in BC, the American Robin, those bright blue eggs. That one's pretty easy. Let's go around the world to find those green eggs, which is we could look at the emu, which has this spectacular sort of speckled, sparkly, dark green egg. Uh, the emu's close cousin, the cassowary, or actually not that close cousin, but 
Equally ancient and scary looking bird, the cassowary has bright green eggs. What about pink though? We could look at the melodious warbler, these beautiful pink eggs uh, found in Europe and parts of Africa. But we don't have to go to these crazy uh, unique birds to find these. There are uh, actually a variety of chicken called the Easter egg or chicken, which makes blue, green, and pink eggs uh, all, all by itself. So, so, so many birds that can do this. <laughs> Some excellent facts there. Thank you so much, Darius. Thanks, Janella. It's all aboard in Burnaby with the popular mini railway back in service just in time for the Easter weekend. Everybody's struggling to find something to do with the kids that you can afford. So hopefully we're still in that price range for everybody and everyone can come out and enjoy us. All aboard! While these trains might look like an amusement park ride, they are actually pulled by real locomotives, either steam, diesel, or electric. The train will be in operation starting this weekend, running all the way through until Thanksgiving weekend. Children under two years old can ride for free. That looks like a fun train. Oh, yeah. I remember doing that as a child at the uh, Burnaby Railway there, but of course, you're new to the province, so maybe that's something you can look into. Yeah, well, I'm still a kid, so I can go. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight on CBC Vancouver News. For news anytime, visit our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And for all those celebrating, wishing you a very happy Easter long weekend. See you after it.